The reading today comprises three passages. The first two are from Romans chapter 14 and the third from Romans chapter 15. Starting with the first passage, Romans chapter 14 verses one to four. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. The next passage is from verses 13 to 21. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. And the last passage from Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbours for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Thanks, Michonne. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, Please keep that Bible reading open. It's good to see uh, the church full. Uh, Wonderful, isn't it? Um, We're going to spend some time in the the readings that we uh, had this morning. It's, uh, it's part of our sermon series from, uh, from the book of Romans. We picked up uh, from Romans chapter uh, 9 earlier uh, 
you know, in a couple of months ago. And we've been working through uh, just a bit of a summary. Chapters 1 to 11, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, what Jesus has done to make us right with him. Right? The, the cross and the salvation that we have in Jesus. And we're, chapters 12 to uh, 16 is this overflow of the gospel. How should we live as Christians now that Jesus has rescued us and freed us. What does that freedom look like? Chapter 12, we didn't uh, touch on. We won't be doing that uh, this time around. We've spent some time before, but it basically talks about living a worshipful life, offering yourself as a living sacrifice to God in all what we do. And chapter uh, 13, uh, Kel looked at last week, it's basically looking at how does that Christian life look like in a secular world? How does that look like outside the church? And this week, we come to look at chapter 13 and 14. As I said, there's a lot in these chapters, which we won't be able to uh, look at in, in one sermon. So we're not going to do that today, but we're gonna pick up uh, one of the essential themes that comes up in these two chapters. So before we go any further, allow me to pray and commit this time to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity for us to worship you, and Lord, we thank you this privilege is ours because of what you have done in Jesus to redeem us, to make us your people. So again, as we spend some time thinking, unpacking, what does this look like as we, uh, as we live in fellowship with fellow Christian brothers and sisters? We pray, Father, give us uh, listening ears, open minds, and Father, willing hearts to respond to your word, and we pray for your Holy Spirit to be at work in and through us this morning. Amen. Amen. Uh, so today, to help us, I'm going to bring up five people up on the screen. Um, they're all strong Christians who love Jesus. A disclaimer, they don't represent anyone in this church, okay? Uh, maybe you might feel, but I, have, I don't have any thoughts on who these people are, but they're just random, all right? So first we meet... I can get this working. Uh, first, we meet. There you go. No, that one, Greta. All right, Greta. Uh, for her, uh, she is. Um, she loves the minister to be a male, uh, wearing a suit and a tie, uh, even in a stinking hot day. And uh, she, she loves people to come to church with their Sunday best, right? So best clothes. And she loves singing old hymns. And uh, old means pre-1930s. Right? And she loves liturgy, and she loves using the King James Version of the Bible. Then we meet Emma. Uh, she thinks the minister should look like everybody else. Uh, he or she might wear shorts or T-shirts, uh, have a tattoo or two somewhere in the body. Um, and she loves singing modern spiritual songs. Modern means songs that were written maybe in the last couple of weeks. Um, she doesn't like anything formal. Uh, now, if Greta and Emma uh, don't get what they want at church, they would be utterly disappointed because uh, they, they would also feel that uh, they haven't actually met God or they haven't worshipped God because they strongly believe uh, that these are the ways that we should worship God. Then there is Sally. She has her own um, preferences, uh, but she's not fussed about them. She's not pushy. She doesn't want them to be primary. Uh, she wants songs that talk the truth about God. Uh, she wants to hear the Bible is preached faithfully and truly. She wants to see the gospel is proclaimed. Everything else is secondary for her. Then we meet Bert. 
Now, he's a very strong Christian. He has strong standards. Uh, he believes Christians should never drink or smoke. He wouldn't go to a, a club or a pub, and he wouldn't dream of shopping on a Sunday. Then comes along Raf. Uh, he also wants to live a godly life. In fact, he would never do anything uh, the Bible says not to do. But in areas that Bert was feeling like I shouldn't be doing all this, he feels free. Sometimes he would drink a glass of wine after a meal. Um, he doesn't mind joining his friends to have a meal at a pub or, or a club. And he does his weekly shopping on a Sunday afternoon. Now, how can Greta, Emma, Sally, Bert, and Raf right, get along in a church? It's going to be difficult, isn't it? And you see, friends, although you all are looking in the same direction, um, we are a diverse bunch of people. We each have deeply held convictions, traditions that we follow, don't we? So how are we to get along with one another in the church? Some take the easy way out, don't they? They just leave the church and find a church that, that they can uh, easily agree with, that they can not debate about these things. Others will fight and make life hard for everyone. And the church is divided. The Bible says this is not how Christians should act when it comes to what it calls disputable or debatable matters of faith. Now, there are undisputable matters of faith, right? Fundamental bedrock matters of faith, like the divinity and the humanity of Jesus the sinfulness of man, uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, the divine inspiration of the scriptures. Now, these are some of the non-negotiables, non-disputable matters of faith. We don't argue about this. But in the Roman church, we find, as we read these chapters, we find there were people who had held deeply held convictions about what Paul called disputable matters. And these, dis, uh, these disputable matters, there, there are no clear instructions. Uh, they don't affect our salvation if we do that or not do that. They don't affect our salvation. So Paul picks up a couple of these um, in Romans chapter 14. Diet and dates. Diet and dates, verse two, in Romans chapter 14, you will see. One person's faith allowed them to eat everything. Another's whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. We can assume uh, in this church, in Paul's day, those who eat vegetables only would have been Jewish believers. All their life, uh, they have eaten kosher food. So eating pork or, or a bacon and egg roll in the morning doesn't seem right. He, they can't bring themselves to do it. Paul says that their faith is weak. Because although he's, he's free to eat everything, anything, he is still on a journey. He hasn't come to that point where, where they're ready to eat anything in front of them. The second matter is about dates in verse 5. Again, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day is the same. Again, we can safely assume Paul is talking about a Jewish Christian. They were brought up in a, in a very strict calendar, didn't they? Didn't weren't they? to observe the Sabbath, regular feast days like uh, the Day of Atonement and Passover and, and, and the Feast of Tabernacles, and, and they were important. 
They were kind of imprinted on their lives from, from their childhood. Even though now uh, he or she has become a believer in, in Jesus, they feel bound by the Jewish calendar and, and they're not free in that area. And as we read these chapters, we, we get the feeling that the church was divided over these disputable matters. Uh, they were struggling to get along. There were, there were fights. And instead of the sound of worship and praise, uh, you, you heard the sound of arguing and quarrels and, and fighting in the church. So Paul's advice for, for them and us today is, is quite simple. Accept one another. Accept one another. The word accept here, here, here doesn't mean uh, like just, just tolerate and, and be nice to their face. It doesn't mean to be politically, politically correct. Accept, it, it, it has this sense of, of warmness, isn't it? A warm welcome, a, a, a warm embrace. Receive them well. Uh, make them part of your family. Show unusual kindness. Be, be generous to them. So how do we do this? How do we accept a brother or a sister who, who we don't agree with, especially on disputable matters? I want to bring up three principles from the readings that we had this morning. The very first thing is, is don't judge a brother or a sister over a disputable matter. The word judge or judgment in these verses, uh, it appears a few times. Uh, it, it means uh, to criticize, to condemn, to look down, put down someone, to treat someone with contempt, ridiculing those who don't agree with us and disassociating them from fellowship. And Paul's main point in these 12 verses is don't judge your Christian brother or sister over disputable matters. Why? He's going he's giving three reasons. The very first one, verse three, God has accepted them. God has accepted them. Have a look at in your Bibles. The one whom you are not willing to get along with, the one who, are, who you are putting down, God has graciously accepted them because they trust in Jesus. They now belong to the family. They have now become part of your family, the family of Christ, the body of Christ. And if God has accepted them, who are you to reject them and despise them and condemn them and then talk bad about them? And there's a story of a, of a banquet um, uh, that was organized by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, that evening, there was this one guest who had not actually dressed up for the occasion. He had shabby clothes and then his hair was all unkept. Um, and everyone thought he was a great gate crasher. And, and they were ready to uh, take him out and, and, and usher him out of the building without even having a word and asking why you're here. And then in the midst of all this scuffle, uh, the archbishop turns up and says, hey, what's happening here? He's with me. I've invited him to come along. And then the archbishop took him to the meal. You see, the host has accepted him. If the host has welcomed our, our quirky brother and sister, then, then who are we to dismiss them? The second reason why we shouldn't judge is because Jesus is their master. Jesus is their master. Verse 4, who are you to judge someone else's servant? Friends, we don't own people. We didn't die for people. We didn't save them. We are not the Lord Jesus is. 
And we don't have the right to tell someone else's employee how to do their job or condemn them for not doing their work well. They are answerable, answerable to their master. Verse 8 says the same thing. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. Verse 9, Christ died and returned to life, he says, so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. He's their boss. He's our boss. So don't judge them. The third reason why we shouldn't judge is God is the ultimate judge. Verses 10 to 12, Paul says, we don't have the right to judge anyone, any brother or sister of Christ, because God is the only one who has the right to judge. He is the ultimate judge. We all must stand before the judgment seat one day, and on that day every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is God. And verse 12 says, we all must give an account of ourselves before him. I'm sure you wouldn't give your your car or your computer to someone who's not qualified to, to do their repairs, right? You'd give someone who's authorized. So what Paul kind of saying is, don't try to do a job that you're not qualified to do. Don't try to do a job that you're not authorized to do. Leave the judgments to God, the ultimate judge who is qualified, who has the right to judge the weak and the strong believers. Now, friends, we must remember that Paul is, Paul is not saying here, if, if someone is saying, well, um, Jesus is not God, or uh, salvation is not by faith alone, in Christ alone, or if somebody comes and tells, uh, you know, the Bible is not actually God's word, um, that, that we must agree and accept them. No, he's not saying that. As I said earlier, those are bedrock matters. Fundamental matters of faith, and we should not tolerate such matters. And where the Bible clearly prohibits us from doing some things, which calls sin, we should not say, well, it's okay. I, I, I want you to make up your own mind. No, it's not right. There's a matter in 1 Corinthians, isn't it, where a man is sleeping with his stepmother, and, and Paul says, that is wrong. He should be disciplined. And if he doesn't, he cannot be a brother or a sister in Christ. But when it comes to disputable matters of faith, Paul tells the church, don't judge, don't condemn, don't look down on people, don't reject and treat them badly as second-class citizens because God has accepted them. Jesus is their master. God is the ultimate judge. Accept, accept, accept. And the second principle uh, Paul puts forward is this. Don't cause people to stumble over disputable matters. Don't, call pe don't cause people to stumble over disputable matters. I look at verse 13. It says, without passing judgments on one another, he says, make up your mind. Make a decision to not put a stumbling block or an obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister. Now, in these verses, Paul is actually talking to the strong believers, those who are probably mature 
Christians, those, those who feel well, they were free to eat anything or drink anything what they like. Uh, they were free to worship God on any day, anywhere, any time. Paul says, you may feel right. You may feel this rightly that, that you are now free in Christ to do anything. You have been liberated. And verse, verse 14, Paul says, I feel the same. I am with you, strong Christian. I am with you. I feel the same. But remember, our freedom can easily be, become a stumbling block or a trap for a weak brother or a sister in Christ. Verse 15, he says, if your brother or sister is distressed or troubled because what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Where is love? Where is love? You're actually destroying someone for whom Christ died. And verse 20 has the same sentiment, isn't it? Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Did you hear that? With or without their knowledge, some of these strong Christians were crushing the weak brothers and sisters by using their freedom. Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that to the church. Don't do that to your brother or sister in Christ. Instead, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. What is edification? It is to build people up, isn't it? Build people up. In chapter uh, 15, verse 1, it says, bear with the fallings of the weak. This, this, this bear with has this, this meaning of carrying someone who is weak lifting up and, and walking side by side with someone who is weak. If your brother is, is, is your brother or sister finding it hard in their Christian journey, carry them. Support them. Encourage them. Don't disassociate them. Don't push him further into sin. Don't make it hard for them. What does that mean? Verse 21, we must be willing to give up or stop doing whatever that might cause a weak brother or sister to stumble. Be willing to give up eating meat or, or drinking wine or, or you can fill in the blank to help your weak brother or sister. Verse 22, if you have a strong conviction about something, especially a disputable matter, it says, shut your mouth. Isn't it? Just keep quiet. Keep it between you and God. Don't try to press it on to other people. It's not a matter of faith. It's not a matter of salvation. Keep it yourself. Because... When we focus on, on petty, disputable matters, friends, you know what happens? We are in danger of losing the focus on what really matters, isn't it? When we major on the minor stuff and minor on the major stuff, we are losing something really important, isn't it? I look at verse 17. It says, for the kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, which is about the right relationship with God. Peace between God and, and one another. Joy in the Holy Spirit. How can there be joy when there are disputes and arguments and fights in the church over disputable, petty, minor matters? 
For the Roman church, it was diet and dates. For us today, it might be music. What we wear to church. It might be the style of worship. It might be the version of the Bible that we use. It might be how cold is the air conditioner. It could be a particular view of the second coming that we have. And Paul's call for the strong Christian is, think about what matters most. None of the above. None of the above. What matters is a person's right relationship, a right standing with God, peace, and joy. What matters is the gospel, isn't it? That's what it is. So it says, exercise love over liberty. Love over freedom. Be willing to let go of your rights, your freedom in Christ for the sake of your brother or sister in Christ. Be willing to love them. Put their needs before yours. Be considerate. Considerate of your behavior. Consider how, how it might affect the things that you might say or, or might write on an email or a text message. Be humble. Don't live with short margins. Live with big margins. Building each other up. Willing to let go. I think uh, the, the Puritan, Martin Baxter, uh, said it this way when he talked about these. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, charity. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Finally, and, and briefly, I want to make this very brief. Paul gives us a model to follow, isn't it? To, to, to such living. He says, follow the example of Jesus. Don't follow, don't follow anyone else in the church. You'll be failing. Follow Jesus. Look at him. The perfect role model. Verse 3, he did not live to please himself. He did not serve himself. No, he lived for others. He died for others. He was willing to bear the curse. He was willing to wear the insults of others, took their sins on him, and he did not use his freedom. He could have. He could have. But he didn't. And think about us. He did not condemn us. He did not reject us even while we were still sinners. He accepted us. Imagine that. Imagine that. God accepting me and you into his family. So then verse 7, it says, accept one another. Then just as Christ Jesus accepted you in order to bring praise to God. in order to bring praise to God. Paul, you know Paul's heart in this verse, he's, in this verse he says, I don't want to hear arguments and quarrels coming out of the church. No, I want to hear praises, God's worshipping people singing praises to God for what he has done. That's what I want to hear in the church. And it's not easy, is it? It's not easy. It's not easy to get along uh, for, for those five people that I brought up earlier. It's not easy to get along. And that's why I think Paul has have this, this prayer that he, he writes. He, he prays this prayer, isn't it? May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And there's no surprise why he has a prayer in the middle of this, this section. Because he doesn't want us to lose sight of our inability to do all these. It is not sheer willpower to, to try and get up to someone that we don't agree and, and have a good conversation and to welcome someone that, that we feel quite not with us. We need God's strength. And I think this is a prayer that, that we might need to pray for ourselves not just each Sunday before we come to church, but, but every day that God may give us the same attitude of Jesus Christ towards one another. And we, might, we might need to remember to pray this prayer for our church, that each one of us, as we come here, we will come with the attitude and the mind of Christ towards one another, so that our praise and prayer will be pleasing to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what Jesus has done on the cross has not only broken the barrier between us and you, but it has broken the dividing walls between one another. Lord, you, you, you don't have two different groups of people or three or four different groups of people. No, you have only one group of people who are united in Christ. So this morning, Father, you know our hearts, you know where we are, you know the struggles that we have, perhaps with our brothers and sisters. Help us to see them as accepted by you. Help us to see Jesus as their Lord. Help us to see that you are the ultimate judge. And help us this morning to recognize the stumbling blocks or the traps that we might have knowingly or unknowingly laid for our brothers and sisters and causing them to stumble. And help us, Father, this morning to, to look up to Jesus, a great model who did not think about himself but gave himself up on the cross so that we might be presented to you blameless that we might bring praises to you. And so we pray, Father, for our church. Keep us united. Lord, help us to discern what is, what matters the most and what are the disputable matters. And help us to deal with them in a way that honors you. So that, Father, your gospel may not be tarnished. So we thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.